from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the fifth chapter of John's Gospel. To the fifth chapter of John's Gospel. The fifth chapter of John's Gospel. And I won't, I won't read it to you, I'll just tell you the story. And uh, you will be able to pick it up as I tell it and save the time of reading it. Jesus was going up and down the country and he was preaching and teaching. And the scripture says that he taught as one having authority. He never did say, I hope this is the way to heaven. He said, this is the way. He said, this is it. He taught with great simplicity also. He always told stories to illustrate spiritual truth. He also spoke with great urgency. He indicated that what he was saying was very important and that you must listen. And he also taught with repetition. Someone has suggested that he repeated himself perhaps as much as 500 times. And then another interesting thing about Jesus, he kept the law, the laws of Rome. He said, rend unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. He never led a demonstration against Rome. You never find him leading a vigil. And Rome was a, was a strong and powerful and cruel nation that occupied his own homeland. I don't know whether they had martial law like we read about today in some countries, but they certainly controlled it. But Jesus never led a fight against them. But what he said and what he did and what he taught undermined the whole Roman Empire within a relatively short time after his death, burial, and resurrection. He taught with authority. He taught with compassion, as we've already heard tonight. And he had compassion upon the poor and the needy and the oppressed and the sick. But Jesus' fame began to spread abroad. He makes his way to Jerusalem to attend a great feast. Now, ha had I been in Jerusalem at that time and had I been looking for Christ, where would I look for him? I probably would have gone to the temple where all the religious leaders were. And I would have said, I'm sure that he'll be here. But that's not where he was. Jesus was at a pool of Bethesda that had a pathetic crowd of broken humanity. He was where the people were hurting the most. And so Jesus had gone to this place that was almost like a hospital. It had nine porches, Bethesda. And Nehemiah had built nine gates to Jerusalem, and one of them was called the Sheep Gate, and that's where this pool was located, at the Sheep Gate. And when Jesus went through the Sheep Gate, he probably was reminded of the fact that John the Baptist had said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus was the great Lamb that was to come. Because you see, through this sheep gate came the lambs that were to be slaughtered upon the altars as sacrifices to God, looking forward to, day when, to the day when the great Lamb of God would come. Because you see, all the animals of the Old Testament that were slain were slain in anticipation of the one that was to come that was to lay down his life for the sins of the world on the cross and the most vivid expression or description of the cross is found in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, 800 years before Christ was even born. And you find descriptions of the death of Christ upon the cross in the Old Testament because the Old Testament looked forward to the day when Jesus Christ would become the great Lamb of God and offer Himself upon the cross for our sins. And you'll never understand the Old Testament. Many people call it a bloody religion. Yes, there was a lot of blood shed in the Old Testament on the Jewish altars. But that meant something. That showed the hideousness of sin because the blood that was shed on Jewish altars was for sin. And it was that blood was symbolic of life that was leaving the animal that was only made good when Christ laid down his life upon the cross. 
When he laid down his life upon the cross, that made all the sacrifices made in the Old Testament, made them good and acceptable to God because they were only symbolic of that which was to come in Jesus Christ because Christ's death was planned before the foundation of the world. Because God could look forward and see you and me as lawbreakers and sinners in need of a Savior. And he was offering his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die upon that cross as the great Lamb of God. And Jesus, I'm sure, when he went through that sheep gate and saw these sheep going through, could not help but think that in a short time he would be on the cross shedding his blood for our sins. Now, these porches contained a great many sick people. And they had an idea that uh, the, the pool was bubbling. They had an idea that every day an angel came, or every few days an angel came and stirred up the water and made it bubble. And if you were the first person into that water, you'd be healed. And so people, as soon as the water started bubbling early in the morning, they would all try to be the first one in. This poor man that Jesus went to had tried for 38 years. He had been paralyzed for 38 years. He couldn't get in there first. How discouraged he must have been. Jesus looked upon that scene of terrible misery. And he had compassion upon them. He sees the moral and the spiritual and the psychological and the physical cripples here tonight. Because you see, there are people here tonight that are physically well, but spiritually you're a cripple. You don't have peace with God. You don't have the assurance in your heart that your sins are forgiven. You don't know that you have eternal life. You're not certain of it. Oh, you might have been baptized or confirmed or you've joined a church somewhere and you have some little bit of religion. But you're not sure of your relationship with God. You have a doubt about it. But before this night is over, settle it and make sure. Come to the cross where Christ died for your sins. He sees you. He sees the moral cripples here and the spiritual cripples and the psychological cripples and even the physical cripples. And the Bible describes us all as sick. The root cause of the world's problems tonight is sin. Sin is the sickness. Sin is the problem. And we go around treating the symptoms when the root cause is sin. We're lawbreakers. We've come short of God's glory. And the Bible says all have sinned. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. A lawbreaker. We've broken God's moral law and we're headed toward judgment and we're headed toward hell. Now it describes the different people that were sick there, which we can spiritualize and apply to ourselves tonight. First it says the impotent people who are there. They were the ones that had the law of Moses, but they had no power to keep it. You try and keep the Ten Commandments. Not a person in this audience has ever kept the Ten Commandments. Nobody. There's no such thing as moral perf a person being morally perfect. And then the scripture says this, that if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. So I have to say, I've broken all the commandments. And yet if you've broken only one commandment, You've broken them all, and that makes you a sinner, and no sinner can be accepted in the sight of God. You must be clothed in righteousness to come into the presence of God. God is a holy God. Yes, these people were impotent. They had no power to keep the law. You see, that's the reason I cannot say that I live the Christian life. I can't live it. I can't live by the golden rule. Christ has to live it through me and in me. That's the reason when you come to Christ, He gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came in this age to help us live the life that Christ taught and to obey Him. Then it says the blind were there. Blind. You say, well, I'm not blind. You may have 20-20 vision, but your spiritual eyes are blind. 
You're blind to the fact that you're a sinner before God. You're blind to your spiritual needs because the Bible says that you were supernaturally blinded. Do you know who blinded you? Listen to this in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world is the devil. Satan blinds us. He puts blinders on us. Only the Holy Spirit can remove that blindness. That's a supernatural act of God. When you receive Christ, he removes those blindfolds. Then it says the halt were there. Who are they? Well, they're the cripples who are spiritually and psychologically crippled. They have no strength, no, no strength to obey their conscience. Why? Well, you would like to read the Bible or you'd like to pray, but you're just too crippled to do it. Too spiritually crippled. You don't have any desire to pray. No desire to read the Bible. No desire really to go to church. You go just because it's the thing to do, maybe, or because your parents want you to go. You know, Christ will not let you be a halfway Christian. And there are some people trying it, though. They've got one foot in the kingdom of God and trying to keep the other foot in the world. They've got them in both camps. And neither one is happy. Step on one side or the other. Go all out for Christ. And then he said, the withered were there. Who are they? They had withered hands. Our wills have been paralyzed by sin. You see, the Bible teaches that there are three little men living inside of us. There's the intellect, the emotion, and the will. Now, by wisdom, by your intellect alone, you cannot come to Christ. There is that step of faith. Timothy Dwight, who was president of Yale until the latter part of the last century, the second Timothy Dwight, said that truth can only be dimly seen by the intellect. And how right he was, just dimly seen. You can never come to the truth by the intellect alone, it must be faith. There is that step of faith that you must take and receive by faith. But my emotion looks at Christ on the cross and I say, I could love him. He died for me. I look at the judgments that are promised in the Bible and I'm afraid. That's emotion. But the thing that God is really getting at is your will. He wants you to say, I will receive him as Savior and Lord. But you see, your will has been affected by sin, paralyzed in some cases. You just can't say that. When you got married or when I got married a number of years ago, the minister said, will you have this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? I didn't say I love her. I didn't say, well, she's lovely. I didn't say, will we get along fine? I'd already settled all of that. I said, I will. I yielded my will to her. I yielded my will. Just a simple declaration. And that's what you say to Christ. Now, isn't it interesting that you go and stand in front of a minister and he signs a piece of paper and maybe the wedding lasts 30 minutes or 15 minutes or 40 minutes or however big you have the wedding, maybe five minutes. And you've made a lifetime commitment, supposed to be, just by saying, I will. And when you come to Christ, you say, I will. And that's a lifetime, eternal commitment forever. And he receives you and forgives you and cleanses you. What a wonderful good news that is. Now, this man had been waiting 38 years. He had tried everything else. He had tried 14,000 times to get in that water, if you count every day. And perhaps you could do that. But he was now hopeless, helpless, lying there on that pallet, crippled, no friends to help him in the water first. And Jesus goes up to him. And he went to him probably because he was the worst case there. And he said, do you want to be healed? And I want to ask you tonight, do you want spiritual healing tonight? 
Do you want your sins forgiven? If you do, you that are watching by television, pick up that telephone and call that number that is on the screen right now. And if you don't get it immediately, keep calling and talk to someone about your need tonight and get it settled over the telephone. And you that are here in this great audience, you can get it settled this very night, this very moment by saying yes to Jesus Christ. But you know, Jesus' question to this man sounds almost cruel. Every day he'd tried. But then you start to think about it. It wasn't so cruel after all. Do you really want Christ in your life? Do you? Do you really want him to come into your heart? Are you really ready to meet his demands and surrender everything to him and make him your Lord? It's not easy. It means that some of those things that you've been doing that are wrong, you'll have to give up. It means there'll have to be new attitudes in your life. It means that he becomes Lord of all of your decisions. He helps you to make the decision about marriage. He helps you in your vocation. You must turn to him at every turn and read the Bible and pray and witness and get into the church. It means that your total life is committed totally to him as Lord and Savior. Do you really want that? Jesus said to this man, do you really want to be healed? Do you? You can be tonight. You see, the closer we get to him and realize his demands, the more we're not sure. Jesus said, will you be made whole? Would you let Christ make you whole tonight? Apparently this man answered, yes, I want to be made whole. That's all you have to say, yes, I want to be made whole. Now there are three important things that happened. You must have faith. Jesus said, rise. Now this man had been trying to rise for 38 years. And just at the command of Jesus Christ to rise. But he had faith in Jesus Christ. He looked up and he saw something and he felt something and he knew something that was different than anything else that had ever come into his life. And when Jesus said rise by faith, he took that first step on those paralyzed legs and he walked. He tried it a thousand times before, but it failed. Now he looked at Jesus with faith, something about the way he looked or the voice of authority. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you can be saved tonight. And then there must be repentance, you see. You have to leave the old lifestyle. He had to leave that old pallet, take it up and throw it out, that old dirty place and get out of that place with all of that thing that was there. The old lifestyle had to change. And what a new lifestyle this man had because he was jumping around. His legs were as good as new. For the first time in 38 years, he was not paralyzed any longer. That could happen to you tonight spiritually. And then you have to accept the responsibility. Accept the responsibility. He, Jesus said, walk. Walk a new road. Walk the narrow road with Christ. Walk in discipleship. And when he did that, there was instantaneous healing. And it's interesting to me that the people that came to Jesus in the New Testament, most of them came to Christ and had instantaneous, instantaneous conversion to Christ. They received Christ right then and there in a moment. And they did it openly and publicly. Nobody except Nicodemus ever came to Jesus by night. And we're not sure that was the night that Jesus, that Nicodemus really found Christ. 
But all the people that came to Jesus came to him publicly and openly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly and openly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. He said, this is a public decision. You see, when he died on the cross, he died publicly for you and for me. Now we must publicly say yes to him openly. It's not something done in a secret or quiet place necessarily. It may be made in secret, yes, but there comes a time when you make it public and open and you make your witness known either by the fruit of the Spirit or by telling people or however. And Jesus told him a very interesting thing in verse 14 in this passage. Jesus met him later at the temple. And Jesus said something to him that I want you to always remember. He said, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. What could be worse than 38 years of paralytic? Jesus was teaching that man something about judgment and something about hell that is yet to come if we go on the way we're going. The narrow road, he said, leads to eternal life. The broad road, which most of the people are on, leads to destruction. Yes, you must do something. Jesus told this man to do something. Rise and walk. I'm asking you tonight to get up out of your seat and walk and stand in front of this platform as we've seen thousands do all over New England and say by coming symbolically, I want a new life. I want to know my sin is forgiven. I want to know that I have eternal life. I want to receive him tonight or I want to recommit my life to Christ tonight. I want to settle this thing. I want Christ tonight. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and come and stand in front of the platform. And as you stand here, that will be a symbol, an outward symbol, a public symbol of what you're doing inside the decision that you're making. And then after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and we're going to have a prayer together. Then we'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. And then you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait. You get up out of your seat and you that are watching by television, pick up that telephone and call someone right now. So you come right now from all over hundreds of you. Just get up out of your seat now. You may be a member of the best church in town. Whatever religious background you come from, I'm not asking you to join a specific church tonight. I'm asking you to come to the person of Christ. You may be a professing Christian or you may not have any religious background or Christian background. And if you've come in one of those buses, they'll wait. It'll take you about a minute or two to come from that top stand up there. So start now, quickly. As many people are already on the way, you come and see here in Boston, Massachusetts, Boston University Football Stadium. Hundreds of people have already come and many more on the way to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make that... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 11th verse of Jude. Jude is a little book tucked away in the back of the Bible. And there are just a few verses, and this is just a phrase from one verse. And here's what it says. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Now, that's a strange expression, the way of Cain. And yet, when I pick up the Bible, I find an interesting thing that there are only two ways of life in the whole Bible. One is the way of Cain, and the other is the way of his brother Abel. Abel was accepted by God, and Cain was rejected by God. So there's the way of Abel, and there's the way of Cain. And tonight I want to talk about these two brothers because they were the first children in the history of the human race. God had created Adam and Eve. And they had two children, their first two children, Cain and Abel. 
And we find brothers all the way through the Bible, like Jacob and Esau, and Moses and Aaron, and Absalom and Amnon, James and John, Peter and Andrew, Joseph and his brethren. And in the first or the fourth chapter of Genesis, you'll find the story, the fascinating, challenging, thrilling, tragic story of Cain and Abel. You see, they were the first children born. They were the first farmers. They performed the first religious ceremony. And they had the first quarrel and the first act of violence that was ever done on this planet was done by Cain against his brother when he killed his brother in a fit of anger because of jealousy and envy. But Adam and Eve must have been excited when these boys came along because Eve said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. You see, Adam and Eve had just come through a terrible experience. They had rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden. Now, in the Garden of Eden, where they lived, there had never been a war. There were no armies, there were no police, they didn't need them. There were no jails, there was no poverty, there was no suffering. It was a marvelous world to live in. And they rebelled against God. And God drove them out of paradise, drove them out of the Garden of Eden. And it says a very interesting thing at the end of the third chapter of Genesis, so they wouldn't touch the tree of life. Why? If man had eaten of the tree of life, he would have lived forever in his sins. In that sense, death is a blessing to the human race. Suppose Hitler lived forever. Suppose people like Stalin and Eichmann lived forever and plagued the human race. But one generation passes and another comes. It's constantly changing and shifting. God drove them out so they wouldn't eat of that tree of life and live forever in their sins. But God also promised, before he drove them out, God promised that someday he would send a redeemer. And he illustrated it by going out and slaying some animals and shedding blood and clothing Adam and Eve in skin. And God was teaching that the only way ever to approach him in the future, forever, forever, was by the way of blood. And that is why you pick up the Bible and you'll find so much blood. Someone has said that Christianity is a bloody religion, and it is. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And every time you go and take communion in your church and you pick up the cup of the juice or the wine, it's symbolic of the blood that was shed on that cross for you. And without the shedding of that blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, Cain was born with sinful instinct. Because you see, we inherit the instinct to sin from our parents. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We read in our paper last week how they are now painting garbage cans and garbage sacks with psychedelic colors. And they do look pretty. I saw some of them. But inside, it's still garbage. Now, you're all dressed up tonight. Most people, when they come to a religious meeting, a church put on their best. You may come from a poverty-stricken area. You may not get but about $10,000 a year. You may be in dire poverty. <laughs> and you may be suffering in this beautiful bluegrass part of Kentucky. But on the inside, jealousy, pride, lust, idolatry, all the sins that mankind is guilty of is lurking inside of your own heart. You know, Jesus said, 
to the Pharisees of his day that they were whited sepulchers, but inside they were rotting bones of death. No wonder the Pharisees didn't like him. He called them all kinds of names. You read the 23rd chapter of Matthew. He said, on the outside, you look beautiful, you look fine, you're religious. You look like you're going to heaven, but I can see inside your heart, I see your pride, I see your lust, I see your hypocrisy. And God knows all the secret things and God looks down inside of you and he says to you, Mr. Baptist and Mr. Methodist and Mr. Assembly of God or whoever you may be, I see you and what I see indicates that your heart is full of rebellion. You need forgiveness. You need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Now, when Cain was born, Eve, I think, thought, that the birth of Cain was somehow a gift from God that would cancel out her sins. She thought that maybe Cain was going to be the Messiah that had already been promised. She said, my child is from God. You know, there's evidence everywhere that all of us would like to cancel out our past and our sins. We would like to get in touch somehow with God. But if we reject God's way and go the way of Cain as Cain rejected God, what do we turn to? We turn to the stars. We turn to anything that will get rid of this guilt and give us some purpose and meaning in our lives as to why we exist. And Cain thought, or Eve thought, that maybe Cain was going to help her, her young son. But Cain, you know, was born into a world with tremendous advantages. There'd never been a war. There was no hate and no jealousy, no poverty. He had everything that a person could want. No one was ever killed. Nobody was ever murdered. Nobody ever stole anything. It was a marvelous world. And Cain also was religious. He and his brother both were religious. But that didn't satisfy them somehow. Cain decided to reject God's way. Cain decided to go his own way. And there are only two ways of life, the way of Cain and the way of Abel. They were both religious, and they came to worship God. But they came differently. God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So Abel brought a sacrifice of blood. It was ugly. It was dirty. Why did God choose blood? You ever thought about that? Many of us are repulsed at the sight of blood. We hate to see it. Our sins are ugly. Our sins are dirty. And every time we see blood, it reminds us of our sins which are ugly before God and will cause judgment. But Cain did not bring blood. He said, it's too dirty, it's too ugly. I'm going to bring the best fruits that I have. I'm going to bring the finest vegetables I have as an offering to God. But the Bible says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. The Bible says, only by blood. We say we can get there some other way. We've got our own way figured out. And you know, a lot of people believe in Jesus today. They're accepting Jesus as a revolutionary hero. A lot of people are singing about Jesus, writing about Jesus. All that's fine. I hope it keeps up. But you be sure who Jesus is. He's more than just the superstar. Jesus is the son of the living God. And when he died on the cross, he didn't stay there. He rose from the dead. He's alive. And when he shed his blood, that blood meant something. It meant that God was now able to forgive all your sins. It meant that God was now able to transform you and write your name in the book of heaven because Jesus Christ died on that cross. God can now remain just 
and be the justifier of the sinner. You see, if I may say so reverently, God faced a dilemma. God said, the wages of sin is death. You have to die. You're under the sentence of death. How can God come along and just forgive it and wipe it out? The jury says that a man like Charles Manson is guilty. But suppose the judge would say, oh, we'll let Charlie go on back. He's got all those girlfriends and all those responsibilities and things. We'll just forget all that. That wouldn't be justice. Suppose God would say that to you. You're guilty. I'm guilty. We've broken God's laws, all of us. God cannot come along and say, let's forget it. Unless somebody pays the death penalty. We're under the sentence of death. Well, somebody did pay the death penalty for me and for you. Jesus Christ on the cross paid the death penalty, shed his blood. And now God can say, I forgive you, the debt is paid. That's how much God loves us. That's what the gospel is. The word gospel means good news. And the good news to the whole human race Black, white, yellow, red, whoever you are, whatever your social standing or your educational status, God is saying, I love you, I forgive you. That's the gospel. And I don't care what your sins are. I don't care how bad they are, how black they are, how dirty they are. God says, I forgive you. I love you. And I proved it by giving my son on the cross. That's the way of Abel. Now, the way of Cain is to say to God, no, I want to go to heaven. I want to be saved, but I'm going to go my own way. I'm not going to come your way, God. I don't like the way of blood. I don't like to go by the way of the cross. I don't want to die to self. I don't want to give everything up that I love, all these things desires and passions of mine. They may be wrong, but Lord, I want to hold on to them. I'm going to go my own way, and somehow I'll get that. No, you won't. There's only one way to heaven, one door. It's the way of the cross. And without the cross, there is no salvation according to the Bible. So they brought their sacrifices to God. And you know, we're doing the same thing. We go to church. We try to live a good moral life. We pay our bills. We do the best we can. And we think that's going to be good enough. No, there has to come a time when you must be born again. There has to come a time when you are converted. And notice the scripture says in Hebrews 11:4 that Abel made his decision for God by faith. Abel didn't understand it. You don't have to be a theologian to come to Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand much about the gospel or the Bible when you come to Christ. Come with what little knowledge you have. You know you're a sinner. Your conscience tells you that. You know Christ is the Savior. That's all you have to know. Just come and receive it by faith. It says by faith, Abel made his sacrifice unto God. You see, Cain didn't come by faith. He came by his own works and his own goodness and his own ideas, chose his own path, and God said, no, Cain, you're rejected. But he accepted Abel, and Abel, for certainty, is in heaven, and we'll see him someday. Now, what happened? Cain became jealous. He became angry. And one day when they were out in the field, he picked up a rock and hit his brother over the head and killed him. Murder. The first violence. The first murder. The first war in the history of the human race. And it's been going on ever since. And it'll always go on till Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. Because you see, war comes from the human heart. 
Bible says, from whence come wars among you? Don't they come from your own lust? that war in your own beings. The world wars that we fought in this century are only extensions of the wars in our own hearts. There are many wars going on around the world right now, in addition to Vietnam. Man is a warring animal. He'll continue to fight and kill. There are wars going on in the cities of this country right now and in the rural areas. People being murdered by the hundreds every month. People being killed on the highways by drunken drivers and drivers under the influence of drugs. Fights and quarrels in homes between husbands and wives and children and parents. War, war, war. We're a warring people. And the first act of violence was committed by Cain because of jealousy. You see, it started in his heart. He probably thought about it a long time. He was jealous of his brother. And this jealousy gave vent until finally it ended in murder. And God came along one day and warned Cain. said, Cain, you know, sin crouches at the door. Even before he had ever committed that murder, God saw his heart and God saw what he was thinking. And God said, Cain, watch out. Sin is in your heart. It crouches like a tiger. It crouches like a lion, ready to spring. I've heard people stand up and say, well, if I were in a certain place, I wouldn't do a thing like that. You don't know what you would do. You give all the circumstances surrounding that certain event, you might do it. We all have the tendency to lust and to hate and to have jealousy and pride in our hearts. We don't know what we would do. We're all rebellious against God. And under given circumstances with the right type of temptation, we might do anything. Or the right type of pressure, we might do anything. And Cain was warned by God. And God warned you in the Bible that you're capable of any sin. And every person in this audience tonight has broken the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says, if you've broken one, you're guilty of all. And after the death of Abel and after the murder had taken place and Cain had probably buried him to try to hide the evidence, God said, Cain, where's your brother Abel? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And then God said this interesting thing. He said, the voice of thy brother's blood cries up from the earth. The Bible says your sins are written down. God said, Cain, you've sinned. I have to judge you. And God did judge him. God said, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And for the rest of his days, Cain bore that punishment for that one violent act in which he killed his brother. Jealous of him, hated him, then killed him. Give your life to Christ and you can face reality. You don't have to have a drug or a pill or a glass to face the reality of life or the circumstances or the troubles or the trials you're going through. Let Christ come in and take over your life and cast all your burdens on him for he careth for you. The Bible says that the Lord set a mark on Cain and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Notice, he was close to paradise, yet a million miles from it. Billy Sunday once said, I'd sooner be a foot out of hell and headed away than to be a million miles out of hell and headed toward it. Some of you are close to the kingdom of God, but you might as well be a million miles away because you're headed in the wrong direction. You're headed in the direction of Cain. Religious, but you haven't yet experienced Christ for yourself. Others of you are headed toward heaven and the kingdom of God, stumbling, faltering, failing maybe. But yours is the way of Abel. You've come by the way of the cross. And you're saying, Lord Jesus, be my Lord and be my Savior and be my Christ. 
These two young men, Cain and Abel, typify all the young people that are in the world today. What about you? Have you made your commitment and your decision to Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him? You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do? You have to repent of your sins, and that means you have to be willing to give up your sins and change your way of living. Secondly, you have to come by simple childlike faith. Notice I said childlike. Jesus said you have to become as a little child. Now, there are many professors here tonight. You might be a PhD in science or philosophy or psychology or some other discipline, but you have to become as a little child intellectually and spiritually. And you have to say, Lord, I don't understand this. This is a realm that I don't understand, but I come by faith. It has to be a child's faith, like the faith of a child in its father or mother. And then you have to say, I'm willing to follow you and serve you no matter what the cost. Young man, young woman, father, mother, whoever you are here tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, as hundreds have come at every service, and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. I want to go the way of Abel. I want my past forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I'm going to ask you to get up and come right now. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a word of prayer, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. Those of you up in the gallery, it'll take a minute or two for you to come. But you get up and come right now, quickly, hundreds of you. Just get up from everywhere and come and stand here quietly. And the choir is going to sing, Just As I Am. You may be in the choir, and God has spoken to you tonight. There's a little voice that says you ought to come, the voice of the Spirit of God. And you may never have another moment quite like this. You get up and come.